Stanford University. Uh, welcome to the David Ramsey Map Center uh, and to the inaugural Barry Lawrence Rudman Conference on Cartography. Uh, my name is Salim Mohammed, and I'm the head and curator of the center. I, I will return to speak uh, more in just a bit, uh, but for now, I call upon Mimi Coulter, Deputy University Librarian, to say a few words and do us the honor of inaugurating the conference. Thanks very much, Salim. Um, it is my great pleasure to welcome you all here to the David Rumsey Map Center and to uh, and to inaugurate initiate this this Barry Lawrence Ruderman Conference on Cartography. Uh, we're really thrilled to have uh, to be able to host this event and to have you all here and to be able to host it in this facility um, in this center, which we've uh, worked on for so long. We we opened this center a little more than a year ago, uh, but going back, you know, several years before that, we were when we were in the planning stages. Um, we really did envision this as a place that could host scholars, that could host this kind of conference with, uh, with scholars, with experts, where we could bring people together and uh, give them access to the resources that they need, both technology resources, uh, printed resources, and even the resources of, of access to each other and to, and to experts um, that would really allow everybody to do the, the amazing things that we do. And hosting this conference really is uh, the, the proof that we have managed to, to bring that vision to life in, uh, in opening this center. So we're, we're very pleased about this. Um, I, it is my particular honor to thank our uh, friend and sponsor, Barry Lawrence Ruderman. Um, I think you all know Barry as a map and atlas dealer, but he's a longtime friend and supporter of the Stanford Libraries. Um, since 2009, Barry Lawrence Ruderman <coughs> Antique Maps has contributed more than 50,000 digital map images to our Stanford Digital <laughs> Repository, which is our uh, online system which makes uh, all of these materials available, our, our um, catalog and repository of, of digital resources. Um, he has been a great supporter of our digital philanthropy program in which we digitize materials, keep the, the digital copies available, and, and then return our uh, printed copies to the, uh, to the donor. But he's just been a, a great friend in any number of ways. Um, although on the digital philanthropy front, I do want to note that a substantial portion of the maps that you're going to see uh, during the, the conference are being unveiled online. They have been digitized. They'll be available um, in the library's online catalog and in an online exhibit that we've created to, to highlight this, uh, this event and this program. So you'll be able to revisit online a lot of the uh, materials that you're going to see. Um, so uh, thank you to Barry for that engagement. Barry is also one of the founding friends of the David Rumsey Map Center. Um, and I know we have a couple of other founding friends of the MAP Center here, so I actually want to thank all of the founding friends that we've, that we've got with us today. It's a fabulous thing. But um, Barry was certainly one of the first engaged on that, uh, in that founding friend circle, um, and we just we continue to be grateful for his support and for his ongoing engagement and um, development of our programs. Uh, and finally, though I believe he needs no introduction, I do want to introduce and thank our friend and colleague David Rumsey. Um, David is known to be many things. He's a collector, he's an author, an entrepreneur, a philanthropist. Um, but I want to call out today his pioneering work as a spokesperson, a practitioner, and an innovator in the use of geospatial technologies and visualization techniques. Um, that's really a, a lot of what has gotten us uh, working together and working on, on this space and, and these kinds of events. Um, uh, because of his work, Global scholars have access to more than 150,000 maps, atlases, globes, and other cartographic materials that he's made digitally accessible. Um, and he's been working closely with the library since at least 2008, uh, when he made his decision, for which we are very grateful, uh, to donate his map collection to the Stanford Libraries. Um, and we've had a really fruitful working relationship with him since then. Um, this, you know, not least of which is on this center, which uh, has had more than 3,000 visitors to date and has really become known as a campus destination. It's a, uh, we get 
regular requests for not only for classes and uh, and the expected use of this space, but for tours, for visitors. It, it really highlights a lot of what's good, uh, a lot of what it, some of the interesting work that is going on at Stanford, and is a, a really great place to come and, and uh, very popular. Um, so you know, and David is actively working with the center. He continues to be engaged and involved with us, and um, we're really thrilled that he's also able to be with him with us today. So. Thanks to Barry, thanks to David, and I'm going to ask David to come up and say a couple of words as well. Thank you, Mimi. It is wonderful to uh, see all of you here for the first <clears throat> biannual, I have to say, it's really Barry to me, but it's the Barry Lawrence Ruderman Conference on Cartography. <laughs> We're so excited to see it beginning. Uh, as Mimi said, we all appreciate Barry's support and particularly his vision for uh, how this conference can evolve and we look forward to seeing many more of these in the future. Uh, the Ruderman Conference really embodies exactly what we hoped the MAP Center's intellectual life would be, bringing together scholars and all of you who love MAPS to discuss a wide range of topics uh, <coughs> central to the history of cartography, but also to how maps are being used today in all of our societies. Indeed, uh, looking at the conference program, which is amazing, uh, th that's certainly reflected. Starting tonight with our keynote speaker, Parag Kahana, uh, who will be talking to us about how we map the newly connected world and then continuing tomorrow and Saturday with 14 talks that address an impressive array of subjects <clears throat> from cosmological imagination, map design, exploration, imperial power, colonial cities, Jesuit cartographers, technology and maps, maps and selective histories from China, Japan, and Africa, mapping disease, how maps speak and work, and mapping Palestine. I think looking at this, the remarkable scope of mapping that will be revealed at this conference promises really exciting new uses of maps, and we look forward to supporting those uses in a continuous way at the center. So now I'll turn it over to Salim, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you, David. Uh, I'm so pleased to see all of you here today. Uh, we've had a full house uh, we'll, uh, and uh, a promising two and a half days ahead. Uh, I also want to add my uh, thanks to Barry Rudman uh, for sponsoring this conference and for partnering with, partnering with the Ramsey Map Center to make this conference a reality. This is the first. As uh, uh, David uh, mentioned, we expect to have this occur every other year. Uh, to commemorate the conference, as Mimi mentioned, we are unveiling 19,400 maps from the Barry Lawrence Rudin Map Collection at Stanford. Um, these are showcased at exhibits.stanford.edu slash Ruderman, which is uh, over there. Uh, in addition, all of the speakers at the conference curated a part of this exhibit, the exhibit that you see here today and downstairs by the door. Uh, because not everyone can make it to the center, we propagate those out via spotlight uh, at exhibits.stanford.edu slash blrcc. Um, so other ways to, to, to get at these uh, wonderful maps. Um, it, it's never too early uh, to thank uh, our wonderful crew um, uh, that put this conference together. Uh, we have Katie Parker from London. You'll hear her speak tomorrow. Uh, Jira Fazel, uh, TJ Crisada, he's back in the room. Anna Christ. Uh, special thanks, of course, to, to David Ramsey, Christina, uh, Christina Konjevic, Sonia Lee, Gabriela uh, Karampelas, uh, Julie Sweet Singer, Emily Prince, Wayne Vanderkull, and uh, Becky Fishbach. A round of applause, please. <laughs> now on to our keynote speaker. Barak Khanna is a leading global strategist, world traveler, and best-selling author. He is a senior research fellow in the Center on Asia and Globalization at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy at the National University of Singapore. He's also the managing partner of Hybrid Reality, a boutique 
geostrategic advisory firm and CEO of Factotum, an exclusive content branding agency. Prague's latest book is Technocracy in America, Rise of the Info State. He's, he is the author of a trilogy of books on the future of world order, beginning with the second world, uh, beginning with the second world empires and influence in the new global order, followed by How to Run the World, charting a course to the next renaissance, that's 2011, and concluding with Connectography, Mapping the Future of Global Civilization, that's 2016. Um, this is a big reason uh, why he's here today. Uh, he's, 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 also, he's, he's also the co-author of Hybrid Reality, Thriving in the Emerging Human Technology Civilization. In 2008, Parag was named one of Esquire's 75 most influential people, influential people of the 21st century, and he was featured in Wired Magazine's Smart List. When we were looking for a speaker to keynote the conference, we wanted someone who thought spatially and was looking at radically different ways to interrogate geography through maps and think about space different, uh, differently. Parag's take on rewriting maps based on how we are connected rather than politics and geography is a compelling way on how one might view the current century and how we might proceed to solve the world's problems. Maps, maps by their very nature, are interdisciplinary. Parag's book, Vives Connection, just not between places, but also between different academic disciplines. How appropriate it is then to have him speak here at this conference, at the Ramsey Map Center, and at Stanford, whose students and faculty strive hard to do interdisciplinary work. On that note, and without further ado, Parag Khanna on Mapping the Future. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. Stanford has a very unique ability to erect structures that celebrate uh, fundamental learning in new areas or old areas like cartography, and in doing so, put a discipline on the map uh, for the future in ways that really inspire many others. So, uh, you know, I had a, some of you heard I had some difficulty getting here today. I was in Lake Tahoe just a few hours ago, uh, but SFO was closed. So on the long drive over here, which was uh, fortunately made brief by, uh, by, by paying extra to the driver to break every speed limit imaginable, <laughs> I, had, I had that bit of time to reflect on, uh, on, on uh, again, you know, the, the, the ability that this university has to, um, to really change mindsets. And I think that this center, and uh, with, of course, deep gratitude, David Rumsey, uh, for his generous donation to, to get it up and running, is a very, very powerful example of that. And of course, to Barry Ruderman as well for uh, uh, sponsoring this event and making it possible for all of us to be together this evening. And to uh, Salim, Mimi, Katie, thank you so much. Uh, by, by volume of correspondence over the last uh, one year, uh, I am very, very aware of how much work has gone into this. And I think it's an incredibly exciting uh, opportunity. Sometimes when I think individual scholars are uh, toiling on their own, even if it's digitally and working with the data sets they need, they may not feel necessarily, uh, they may not feel as connected uh, to all of the others uh, out there that are now getting so interested in this uh, approach and, and um, uh, to cartography. But you've all made it possible uh, for us to not only share lessons, but to actually to celebrate it. So I hope that tonight what I can do is to join in, uh, play my small part in kicking off what I think is not only a, a very important learning process, but also in a way, uh, a celebration. So let me dive right in, because I almost can't wait to get to the, the Q&A uh, this evening with such a, a room of uh, brilliant scholars assembled here. But uh, what I want to do is to, in a way, tell a little bit of a story uh, through some of the maps that I've been working on uh, over the years because, of course, I think here, when I look at the program, I see uh, a deep dive into the evolution of cartography and, of course, much of that content being deeply historical. That is not an area in which I can contribute. 
Uh, but when it comes to the evolution of the field, what I'm hoping is to uh, reinforce some of the things that I know those of you who are looking at the future of the discipline, its interaction with technology are working on. And that's an intersection that I'm very, very uh, passionate about. So I'll show you some of the maps. Some are derived from connectography. Some are actually animated. And I'll uh, give, a, give a, a, a shout out to some of the partners that I've been working with who are very, very great fans of this, uh, this center as well. So let me start actually with um, animation because these have, uh, this is obviously a very difficult area in which to bridge uh, GIS material, but also to constantly be trying to update uh, uh, data sets around certain uh, categories of human activity. And so I want to focus right now on infrastructure, uh, which is a very big theme in, in my work. This is um, an overlay of all of the world's major uh, highways and railway uh, systems. Often they run in parallel, of course. On top of that, you get all of the world's uh, oil and gas pipelines and electricity grids. And then, of course, you've got, uh, particularly in the last uh, 25, 30 years, uh, the world's fiber optic uh, internet cable network. So in animating this, you get um, what is a sort of combined functional geography of the three principal categories of infrastructure, transportation, energy, and communications. And right there, you have an image that shows you our combined collective. It's actually still partial. I haven't put in all the airports and seaports and all the other things, all of the other infrastructures. Um, but even just this glimpse right there, you have something that has uh, that political science has more or less ignored for centuries. Right? And that did that wasn't really that hard to do. Um, th this was generated by Autodesk. Autodesk is a great Silicon Valley uh, company, uh, you know, by far the leader in um, in using or in advising on infrastructure projects, architecture, and so forth uh, in the world. And they helped me put this together for, um, for my, my TED talk last year. Um, oops, did we? Oh, we're having a little bit of a glitch. Let me just jump forward again. Jump forward. It's really sensitive. Jump forward. It is very sensitive. <laughs> Good thing you didn't give me that spotlight thing you were telling me about earlier. I'm a novice at that. So I liken this, again, if you do this in a sort of a time series kind of way and you plot out the centuries of history, really the, 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 the millennia of history of human migratory patterns, of our co-evolution with technology from stone tools and, and, uh, and really just you know, cobblestone tracks uh, to railways to um, fiber optic internet cables, this is centuries of layers, millennia of layers of infrastructural history that are now, that really form a very robust exoskeleton. I like to think of this as uh, in, in a sort of organismic analogy sort of way in which we take these layers of infrastructure and these categories of infrastructure and we think about them as parts of a, of a planetary body. Uh, because when you do look at this mapped out over time, that's the way it starts to uh, feel. And this is what I call the global connectivity uh, revolution, if you will. And it's extremely important to think of it, A, in, a, in this evolutionary sense of um, you know, millennia of history in terms of the legacy of human migratory patterns, the human settlements, civilizations, their architectural or archaeological legacies, and how those have combined in a way and connected more and more to each other as our global, as our geographic reach has become more and more global and resulted in the creation of a picture such as this. So I believe to understand that that, that connectivity to me that we are, is, that is now really a fundamental reality in the global system, the, the connectivity of human societies to each other, connectivity of economic systems, the connectivity really also of our, of our uh, environmental uh, systems in a way, is one of the key drivers of global complexity. Right? Complexity is something we all uh, recognize that we are grappling with, even if we have a hard time deciphering specific situations. And one of the things about complexity is that connectivity is why the world is so complex. When we throw our hands in the air and we don't understand how could this happen, right? How could, how could a stock market crash or an election of a certain leader or whatever the case may be, we have to think about all of the different uh, variables, geographic origins and factors. So when, for example, when people want to explain uh, the financial crisis, you don't just look at what happened with uh, you know, mortgage lending rates in the United States. You have to look at the fact that uh, foreign investment 
in purchases of American treasuries that kept interest rates low are a factor in that. So you would want to understand the rise of China and the Asian wealth funds that were buying American treasuries and keeping those interest rates low. Well, why did what caused that to happen? And then you start to map out these patterns and flows in the global economy that take you back decades in order to explain the present. If we, our systems weren't all so connected, we would have it would be much simpler in a way to explain certain uh, phenomena. Similarly, my, my view is that to understand global complexity, you have to take at least three different kinds of, of geography. Then the natural geography, which we don't dispute in, in uh, very often, we don't dispute, uh, we, we take more for granted, let's say, how we map it. Uh, you know, the, the color schemes that represent uh, deserts, oceans, forests, and so forth, natural geography. Political geography tends to, as a political scientist I'm speaking now, obviously, uh, but also as an observer, uh, dominate uh, most of what people think of, again, most people, uh, when they think of geography. These are the maps that hang in all of our children's classrooms. We are raised from birth to the boardroom, from birth to the boardroom. These are the maps, 99.9% of all the maps hanging in public or private spaces in the world is some version of some Rand McNally map. So I, I believe that this is the greatest brainwashing in all of human history because maps are, of course, our form, foremost visual tool for explaining the world. And uh, for, for centuries, we have, as a, in a default way, uh, defaulted to political maps. And so we grow up thinking and never questioning the idea that division is the natural order of things, that we as mankind tend towards division, whether it's a tribal, religious, other kinds of ways of, of uh, separating ourselves from each other. And yet, that's not really the meta pattern of human history if you go back um, as, as far back as you can. Again, if you go back 60,000, 70,000, uh, 70, um, uh, a thousand years to our sort of um, uh, migratory wanderings across the continents, it's really our, it's been actually a constant effort to use the technological tools available to build connections to other societies. And I think that that's why functional geography is an important layer in addition to the political, in addition to the natural. And again, this field has been very much uh, neglected. Uh, Salim mentioned how important the sort of interdisciplinary character of this enterprise is for all of us. And I've had to take this terminology from architecture, right, from urban studies, and to find a way to translate it into geopolitics, which is really my field, which tends to work much more in these two uh, categories of natural and, and political geography. And yet today, I don't think you can understand much of anything useful about 21st century geopolitics uh, without understanding the functional geography uh, dimension. And again, there is so much about this that is about technology. It's, uh, it's the, the tools that we have available today to conduct the topographical engineering that has made functional geography, that has made infrastructure such a uh, pervasive reality that has such an impact on our economic, uh, strategic, geopolitical kinds of systems. So I like this quote by the architect Santiago Calatrava. He says, what we build today will last for centuries. And of course, he meant it as a, as a as a paien, as a homage in a way to the great architectural <laughs> monuments that he and other architects are building today around the world. I actually take it to be completely literal uh, because the, the robustness, if you will, the longevity, the durability of, uh, of uh, pipelines, internet cables, all these kinds of things are actually far more, uh, have a far, far greater durability than much of what today is central to political uh, geography because there are states that are that have ceased to exist in the last uh, you know couple of years or generation if you think about the Arab Spring uh, under whose soil or above whose soil passed these you know pipelines uh, that were built in the early 20th century so actually functional geography in many ways is becoming more immutable than the political geography that we tend to think of as so sacred and sacrosanct so it's ironically enough, as someone who's who's trained in political geography, it's become my mission to overturn it <laughs> at every possible in every possible way. So this um, this this the, the the pace of this topographical engineering, which is a very important term that comes really from military uh, history. Uh, if you go back to the Lewis and Clark expeditions that that brought American settlements uh, uh, across. 
um, across this great uh, continental uh, landmass and um, and U.S. military and other military uh, expeditions that sort of helped to uh, pave uh, the the necessary infrastructures for military planning and expansion and so forth. That topographical engineering, that capacity, is improved obviously with our technological uh, tools, and it's made connectivity, if you will, connectivity being almost a um, a term that we think of as being so ethereal and, and wireless, if you will, and yet every instance of human connectivity, of interaction, again, whether it's between people or within societies other than just face-to-face -face contact, requires actually some physical infrastructural foundation in order for it to actually transpire. To take a simple statistic, uh, 75, 80 percent of world trade occurs between countries that do not share a border, right? And even if they do share a border, you still need infrastructure across that border to enable that trade. And then 75 percent, the vast majority of world trade in goods, of course, occurs between countries that do not border each other. How would it be possible? And then, of course, leapfrogging into the 21st century of digital technology, how would we have, obviously, the global communications without actually the physical underpinning of the internet, which again, a lot of people take for granted as a wireless thing, but it is nothing of the sort. Um, it is very, very physical. And if you don't map that functional geography, you certainly don't appreciate it. And so we have uh, actually a, a crisis of underinvestment in infrastructure uh, in, in this country and in, in many places around the world globally uh, to cope with the, the infrastructural needs of the majority of the world's population. So in any case, um, you know, my view of connectivity is that it, in fact, is a very physical thing and that these, uh, these categories of infrastructures that together combine to make up connectivity are really helping us to overturn this ancient uh, adage with which we're all familiar. You know, geography is destiny. Uh, where you are born determines your ultimate fate in life. Uh, landlocked countries are, you know, almost uh, destined to be uh, sort of be, be failed states, if you will. A lot of these sort of conventional wisdom and shibboleths are being really overturned through various dimensions or, or instantiations of, uh, of, of connectivity. And, and to me, given again the fact that this is a pattern that really uh, has, has been building over thousands of years, to me it is in fact the most fundamental truth about our human interactions over time. Not that we are necessarily tribal and always seeking to splinter, uh, although there is that, but even more fundamental is that we are always seeking to connect across uh, those divisions to the extent that they exist uh, at all. And that's really what, again, the history of the last three or 4,000 years in particular shows us when we look at uh, the origins of, of diplomacy amongst uh, Mesopotamian civilizations and tribes and so forth, the sil ancient Silk Roads and so forth. There has always been a desire to connect communities to the extent, uh, to the extent possible. So now, uh, leapfrogging quite a bit, um, you know, there's a couple of online uh, or sort of, you know, um, web-based efforts that I've been um, uh, supporting to, uh, this one is with a, a Development Seed, which is a, a offshoot of Mapbox in Washington, which does a lot of work with the development community, with uh, the World Bank and others, to help to, um, uh, to uh, deal with uh, crisis situations, humanitarian disasters, and so forth. And what we've been doing is to put uh, online, uh, or to, again, to combine in this way the various infrastructural layers. And if you log on to this site, you can sort of select and deselect and toggle and navigate around. And and uh, of course, it's a real struggle to update uh, infrastructure data sets. Not only is there such an enormous volume of new activity that's going on, but some, some data sets are very sensitive. So try to get electricity uh, grids, for example, from, uh, from a utilities company. I, I've been threatened, actually, that if I were to put certain things online, you know, I'd get sued and, and all this kind of stuff. Um, uh, internet cable maps, right? Tough to come by, the terrestrial ones. The, the uh, maritime cables are very easy. Uh, to find, but uh, but the, there, there's a belief that there is that there's less risk to them by by putting their exact locations on maps. But the terrestrial ones are are hard, and again, you'll be threatened by public agencies if you if you put it all online. But shh, don't tell anyone. But they're pretty much always laid along, along railway tracks, right? So you more or less know where the terrestrial uh, cables are. But in any case, what I think this this help efforts like this, and uh, certainly those that. <clears throat> That, that, again, uh, accumulate the layers and even animate them, get us closer and closer to a dream that, we, that, that I think we probably all share. Uh, and again, I guess you could 
add on other new technological disruptions like augmented reality and virtual reality, the ability to really navigate through in real time uh, these layers of, um, of the world's geographic sort of uh, categories, natural, political, and functional. And that's, uh, you know, I think, I think we all share in that uh, effort. Another one is uh, being led by, um, by Jeff Blossom at, uh, at Harvard at the Center for Geographical Analysis using um, their proprietary uh, Harvard World Map base map. So we're also using this uh, tool to update infrastructure uh, data sets. Again, navigable, a bit more colorful, and, uh, and so forth. I'm going to be showing you more of uh, his maps as well. So the second mega trend that I see alongside connectivity uh, is urbanization, right? Alongside infrastructure in, a, in the sense of transgeographic connectivity is also the sort of stationary, if you will, uh, pattern of, of human sort of civilizational development. And that, that is urbanization as a very organic and in many ways irrevocable mega trend, uh, precisely because it is so organic, precisely because, again, over thousands of years we've seen that there there is a, a sort of you know human desire, if you will, to congregate into urban conurbations and settlements, such as have been mapped out here. Really, if you go back a step, at the risk of um, messing with the system, I want to go back so you can see just from 1950, the uh, you know where, how bright were the lights, if you will, as seen from space versus uh, the year 2016. It's quite remarkable. So you've had a, uh, a tripling of the world population since around uh, World War II, but obviously uh, a far larger degree of growth in the world economy and global electrification, urbanization, and so forth happening simultaneously. And so this, to me, is, um, again, a map, if you will, of functional geography. How are we, as humankind, using the space that is inhabitable in the world? And it's more revealing, in a way, to look at this demographic distribution than just to look at a political map on which, you know, of course, there, there, there are no people, right, on our political maps. But we actually have it within our power to add that layer in there. I want to focus on urbanization because, you know, again, traditional uh, political maps, those that, again, we default to, all cities are the same size black dots, right? A little black dot. Uh, but as you probably well know, but I think it will be memorable, uh, memorably driven home right here, uh, is that the, 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 that many of the most significant cities in the world, those that are really reshaping the world economy and geopolitics, uh, are, are not just little black dots, right? So we start uh, in the Pacific Northwest, and you get this uh, corridor that stretches from Vancouver down to Seattle. And the cross-border nature of these uh, urban um, uh, conurbations and megacity clusters is very, very significant because cities are increasingly drivers of economic uh, decision-making and in foreign policy and so forth. And so you see more and more a very pragmatic approach that cities have to collaborating across borders in terms of building uh, combined uh, uh, shared infrastructure. Um, here we are, of course, uh, in, in, in the Bay Area. And so, um, you know, what was just San Francisco to San Jose in terms of Silicon Valley of, of yore, the way it's spreading into uh, Oakland and the way in which, uh, you know, companies may be migrating, people as well, the broader population growing, this, this entire cluster, if you will, isn't one of the largest megacities in the world by any stretch of the imagination by population. Uh, no American city uh, will, will, will meet that test, but obviously as an economic unit, right, and as, a, as an innovative unit and center, this is what it, it looks like. Then you've got Los Angeles through San Diego to Tijuana in uh, Mexico. And here's another interesting example of the cross-border effects because um, there was an, an effort, uh, or dialogue at least, and, and they perhaps almost got to the proposal stage of San Diego and Tijuana jointly uh, bidding to host the 2024 Olympic Games uh, or 2028 or something. So they haven't made that bid yet, but I think it, it will come. And again, it's an example of how a functional geography uh, sort of you know triumphs, if you will, or at least pragmatically um, uh, reshapes the way we think about political geography, because ordinarily it would be one city in one country that wants to host the Olympics, right? Not a consortium of two cities across a international boundary. That's not happened before, but that's the kind of thing that is, that is coming. Here we are uh, on the uh, you know east coast of the United States, from um, from Boston through New York, Philadelphia to Washington. We would uh, those of us who are from the east coast know this as the Amtrak corridor. Uh, sadly, it still is just the Amtrak corridor. <laughs> We don't have the high-speed railways that um, that President Obama um, had 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 rightly, you know, promised 
one of the maps that I found very significant right after his election was the proposed high, uh, sort of eight high-speed rail uh, clusters that, uh, again, if you think about it in the wake of the financial crisis, um, were the shovel-ready projects that would have had a pretty significant fiscal uh, impact. But sadly, President Obama is no longer in the White House, and we have zero kilometers of high-speed rail. Uh, but it would the, the efficiencies that would be brought, and again, one of the interesting things that location-based services uh, are, are doing today is helping us to make the political case for greater infrastructure investment, because just in this corridor, you can start to quantify um, the cost and the economic drag um, that 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 uh, that is that is lost, uh, and the sort of productive time that is lost by sitting in traffic or by having trains break down and this kind of thing. And it is you know hundreds of billions of dollars. Uh, of lost activity. So now we migrate over to uh, to Asia, where we can see that you know the, the mega cities of the world of the clusters are not just populations of 10 or 15 million people, but more like 60 to 70 or 80 uh, million people. You know, a much much uh, larger scale, which of course befits the is befitting for the global demographic uh, picture, which is that most of the world's population lives, in fact, in Asia. So we're accustomed to thinking of uh, of Tokyo. This is the Tokyo Osaka corridor. Um, as the largest sort of mega city cluster in the world. This is most of Japan's population, most of its activity. But interestingly enough, um, according to The Economist, uh, the, a survey, uh, a special report that they did just a couple of months ago about the um, Pearl River Delta region, which I don't have that long extender stick thing. Let me, oh, here we go. Although I could just test all of you to see if you know which of these circles is the, is the Pearl River Delta. But of course, it is, it is this one. Um, according to the Economist, um, that is uh, officially, you know, the largest megacity cluster in the world now, a larger population than Greater Tokyo, and of course it stretches actually from Guangzhou all the way down to Hong Kong. What's so interesting, again, about the relationship between functional geography and political geography is that it was 20 years and three months ago that Hong Kong did not even belong to China, of course. It was only handed over back from the British to China in, uh, in July of uh, 1997. But prior to that, and especially since that time, what you've seen is enormous investments in really bridging uh, the, the sort of geographic, economic, infrastructural gaps between the cities of the Pearl River Delta, such that functionally, it's really one economic system and has become one, even though politically it is not one uh, system. And uh, so you have a projected uh, economic value of this, um, of this cluster, um, they, they say about uh, $2 trillion or, or moving towards $2 trillion by the year 2020. To put that in perspective, um, the total GDP of India today is $2 trillion, right? Now, if you were an astronaut in space circling the Earth, you wouldn't really know, you wouldn't be able to spot exactly Hong Kong and the Pearl River Delta from space. You could certainly see India. But here you have in this, you know, nearly invisible from space little conurbation, a, a GDP value that's that large. So what we're seeing today is where you have infrastructure investment, urbanization, demographics, and of course, you know, productivity and economies moving up the value chain. Um, that is so much more significant than just territorial size and political geography for shaping the future of power. Um, the Beijing, uh, Bohai Rim area to the top, Shanghai, and the Chongqing Chengdu cluster in uh, central China uh, round out the picture. But of course, I don't. I haven't put the map up in this um, in this show, but it's in the, in the book. Um, there is a um, there is some work that's being done looking studying Chinese administrative reorganization. And to me, it's fascinating because you have an ancient civilization, five thousand years of history, uh, very distinct provincial linguistic uh, histories, and yet they have still been able to impose an administrative reorganization of the country along these functional lines where they're saying, yes, we are a, you know, a, 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 a sort of vertically integrated empire, and we do still have these 30 provinces, but equally important to understand China today, and particularly its political economy, is that it is officially 28 mega city clusters uh, like this, right? And so much of the work that's going into the Chinese economy, economic reform, uh, infrastructure investment, um, uh, economic strategy for new cluster development, all of that is based on those 28 cities, not on this province or that province and the kind of uh, political geography that obviously shapes the way um, spending is done in the United States, for example. 
then you get into uh, India, which uh, as I mentioned, you know, in terms of GDP, um, you know, stacks up as an entire country more or less against one Chinese megacity. So the total economy of India is, is still only about one seventh that of uh, one sixth that of China. But its population uh, by 2025 or so is, uh, is estimated to, to surpass that of, uh, of China. So you're looking at 1.4-ish billion people in India, but with very impressive growth rates and a very young uh, population. It, it will not catch up in terms of you know, uh, uh, GDP total size or per capita to China for a very long time. But it's clearly uh, focused so much on urbanization for many of the, the reasons that I mentioned. So it isn't a surprise to me, given that there's really two major uh, you know, mega city clusters in India, the Delhi capital region and Mumbai, but 1.4 billion people. So it shouldn't surprise anyone that when Prime Minister Modi was elected, one of his first, one of his campaign platforms was certainly infrastructure investment, and one of his first political platforms was this idea of 100 uh, smart cities, which didn't mean 100 new cities. It meant taking at least 100 of India's many, many cities and um, getting their infrastructure up to speed, you know, better sewage systems, transportation, new business districts, all the kind of kind of basics. And India today is spending about you know, 20 percent of its annual budget just on infrastructure, uh, which is a very, very high a ratio, but a very necessary one given the population. Um, I'm going to be coming back to the to the Arab world uh, subsequently, but I just wanted to point out that you know this is one of the regions where uh, political geography is of such limited utility given the very recent history of the actual existing state boundaries, whereas it is in fact a region of the world that has always been urbanized, right? Because it is the desert, so you are living in uh, coastal oases that have now grown over time into into the into the cities uh, that they are so the arab world is about 400 million people 90 plus percent of arabs live in uh, live in in cities this is the nile river delta so cairo up to alexandria egypt is the most populous arab country uh, but most of its population is really clustered uh, around here um, you've got greater tehran up there uh, iran's population is as large uh, as Egypt's, and increasingly uh, people are migrating northward towards, uh, towards that greater Tehran region. This is the Persian Gulf uh, sort of city-states. They would like to call it, they call it the Arabian Gulf, of course. Uh, just to be politically correct, I'll say both. Um, but it's, a, it's a, a, a Bahrain, a Qatar, stretching through uh, Abu Dhabi and Dubai, up to Muscat and Oman. And these are increasingly becoming, despite the rifts uh, that they're experiencing right now, it has been in the process of integrating more and more infrastructurally into this sort of coastal uh, cluster of cities. And this is, again, how you take very small uh, uh, post-colonial, uh, really feudal tribal monarchies and, um, and that have oil, but actually um, bring the population together with this new infrastructure investment into a new kind of uh, economic order that they're building there where services are playing a, a larger role uh, increasingly and they're actually preparing in some ways or trying to prepare for a post-oil uh, uh, future. And Africa is interesting and from a functional geography standpoint because again, in terms of post-colonial political geography, you have 53 countries, many straight lines on the map, the, the likes of which we're always trained to be very suspicious of. Uh, but from a functional standpoint, because you have very little transcontinental uh, infrastructure, when you, when you map out the functional geography and the urbanization, uh, and you know the economic sort of uh, value creation of the geography of African economies, what it really comes down to to understand Africa is three places. And that's the Gauteng province of South Africa, where Johannesburg and Pretoria are, the capital, uh, Nairobi in Kenya, and Lagos. Uh, so Lagos, uh, Nigeria, which lies in the western part of the country on the coast, is increasingly building uh, sort of infrastructure corridors to the other West African countries immediately to its west and building up that sort of corridor. So again, what matters more to understand uh, where Africa has been? Of course, you of co you don't want to ignore the fact that it's been uh, parceled and partitioned into 53 countries. But if you want to understand how it operates today, you would actually be looking at these three urban clusters of Nairobi, Johannesburg, and Lagos, and you'd be looking at the, the radius 
of economic influence and gravity that these three have, because these are the hubs to which everyone is attracted. Everyone, I mean, so much, so much of the African population has is 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 connected to these three cities, even if they never actually cross a border to go to those cities. These are where the supply chains really reach them from. So to kind of pan back you get this sort of global uh, image now of the 48 or so. Now, this is taking projections from the, from the World Bank and other sources that are looking out to 2030 and saying, what are going to be the key uh, urban demographic uh, uh, hubs of the future? And there's about, uh, depending on which source you look at, anywhere from 45 to 50. So I've, I've pointed them out for you here. What are the principal sort of economic uh, um, areas or urban geographies? Again, much of the world is darkened out here, right? And the world has 200 countries. We have more countries than ever. Uh, when, the, when the UN was founded, it had 51 members. Today, it has 200. But is that really what you need to understand complex dynamics in the world economy and geopolitics? Uh, or do you need some additional layers of information, such as what are really the key uh, urban economic hubs and what impact do they have in a cross-border sort of way. So, for example, um, you don't see Singapore, uh, where I presently live, uh, uh, lit up here at all because it only has five million people. And again, by Asian standards, that's that's actually pretty small uh, these days, right? Uh, the, Asia is five billion people and Singapore is just a tiny little place. So it's not even there as a mega city, but 75% of all the foreign investment that flows into ASEAN, which is a region of 800 million people, who, which has any number of mega cities lit up here, like Ho Chi Minh City, uh, Bangkok, Jakarta, Manila, and so forth, 75% of the investment that ultimately makes it to those mega cities goes through one city that's not lit up here at all, right? Singapore. So um, these cities matter in some ways, not in others. Not being, uh, when I show this uh, slide in certain places, you know, people say, uh, for example, let's say when I present this in Australia, it's not lit up at all. So you can imagine uh, <laughs> Australians know that they're, they're better at geography than most. They have some sense of how remote their geography is. So when I put this up in Australia, in Australia, they're like, oh, you know, how come we're not lit up on your map? This is a disaster. Does this mean we don't, does this mean we don't matter in the 21st century? I say, no, no, calm down, relax. Um, you know, the, the fact is that being on this map isn't necessarily a good or a bad thing, right? There are plenty, there, there are mega cities here where you don't really want to go, you know, and Kinshasa is never going to be the center of the world economy. And you know you maybe don't want to spend a day and a half of your life driving from one end of Sao Paulo uh, to the other, right? These mega cities have lots of, of problems. But they're certainly, from a, let's say, a business standpoint, right? They're, they're critical markets. So uh, you know whenever uh, a company is looking at something like this, they can simply have a checklist and say, what, where are the cities where we're doing business and where do we need to do business? And that's why a functional map like this is useful. But for Australians, you know, the combined population of Australia it would fit into Jakarta, right? So of course, they're not going to have any single particular mega city on this map, but it's still a very, a very large, very relevant economy, very prosperous uh, society. And of course, it can share, its cities can share a lot of lessons, uh, as Singapore does, with some of these uh, larger cities because they're much better governed and, and managed. And part of what needs to be done, in fact, and I think that is in the next, um, jump forward here. Let me jump in. Yeah. Part of what needs to be done, one of the principal lessons that does have to be learned, is how to dissipate our infrastructure investment to cope with the very large uh, population size that we have in the world. So this is, um, this is one of my, my favorites. Uh, this was um, done by uh, Claire Trainer at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and it's in, in the middle of uh, connectography. What we wanted to do, again, is to start with human uh, demography, right? We wanted to say, well, first of all, again, I have a big problem with maps that get the scale of cities wrong and that ignore human life, right? And I don't think I'm asking for too much here to correct for these two things. So we started out by saying, hey, wait a minute, where are the people? So this is uh, every human being in the world is a pixel on, on this map. So here you get a nice, accurate sense of, of global demographic distribution. Then you've got, uh, again, in an, these ovals are the mega city clusters, again, the 45, 50 of them. But here what we've added on is the larger circles that show you the economic value of a specific city relative to the national uh, GDP. And that's where you start to see the distortions, I mean, the incredibly skewed um, sort of you know, political economy of 
uh, of urban geography uh, around the world. Even in advanced economies like the United Kingdom, you can see just what a significant role London plays in the national economy. Uh, the United States is better balanced, right? Uh, LA, well, the sort of West Coast corridor and East Coast together don't represent 50% of American GDP. It's more like about 30% uh, between uh, the two of them. Uh, but in developing countries, in a place like, um, like the Philippines or Indonesia, you will have the capital city representing anywhere from 50% to 80% of the GDP of the country. But remember that those countries have anywhere from 100 to 250 million people, right? So in Indonesia, only 20 million people who live in Jakarta represent most of the economic activity in a country of 200 million people. So what it is is actually a warning sign that these countries are terribly underinvesting in all of the rest of their populations, and their populations are not really going to live up to their potential. We call them the next great dragon economies, and we have all sorts of you know, pick the animal of your choice to describe what their anticipated economic performance is. They will never, ever ever live up to expectations unless these countries invest a lot more in the infrastructure uh, in the second tier, third tier cities where those populations are. So again, we need the, the infrastructure to help us to explain whether or not the demographics actually uh, matters. And then, of course, once you're in a city, what's so fascinating is that uh, the cities d are, you have a, it's very difficult for economists to quantify the endogenous economic value of a city. So much of what makes a city a thriving uh, economic hub is the fact that much of its economic activity is uh, comprised of transactions with, with other cities. Um, and so I actually don't think that there, there is no good methodology, really. I mean, how would you, if you were in New York City or in London, how could you tease out that which is only indigenous you know, economic activity, transactions only between people that has no relationship to um, international business travel, international supply chains, global manufacturing systems, and, and all of that sort of stuff. The, the internet and wherever the data may be stored in transactions, with, you would need to tease all of that out. I think quantum physics would be more helpful than economics as it is today uh, to really try and figure out uh, the, the actual value of, of a city economically independent of its connected, of its its connectivity role to other cities. And the larger a city becomes, the more that becomes the case. And of course, we're moving into a world of ever larger cities, which means that in a de facto sort of way, we're getting into much more complex global uh, economic systems. Um, I already talked through with the Pearl River Delta, the shift from the political to the functional geography. And again, what we tried to do is to take um, the, uh, the infrastructure corridors that have been developing from uh, Hong Kong up to, to Guangzhou and map them. The same thing we did here for um, for what's called the growth triangle between uh, uh, Singapore, uh, Malaysia, and Indonesia. And again, the, the functional geography lens gives you a lot of insight into, um, into the way in which I would say maybe in particular Asian economies are starting to think because uh, you know, we, we applaud them to some degree for their breakneck economic growth, but some of it has happened precisely because they've started to think beyond political geography. And this is a good example of that. Because Singapore is a very small country. It has, um, uh, you know, to use uh, economic factor inputs, uh, very little uh, land, very little labor, but it has lots of capital. Whereas its neighbor, uh, Malaysia, has uh, lots of land, uh, quite a bit of labor, uh, but less capital. And then you've got Indonesia, which has very little capital, but lots of land and lots of labor, right? And economics is about the optimization, actually, of land, labor, and capital. It's not about countries, per se, right? The, 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 the intrinsic unit in economics or the factor inputs of production, not a country as such. So starting 25 years ago, they said, let's figure out how we can optimize our differential land, labor, and capital uh, inputs. Let's take, uh, you know, Singapore has the money to do shipbuilding, but it has no space to do shipbuilding. So let's locate shipbuilding on one of these islands. Let's do electronics on another island. Let's take advantage of cheap labor and space and proximity to a port where we can put the electronics on a ship. Let's do real estate and commercial developments uh, somewhere else. And together, what you find is that now the fastest growing geographies of these other countries are the ones that are closest to Singapore, even though they're not in Singapore. And Singaporeans are deriving a lot of their economic uh, gains from, from their returns on investment, not from their own country, which has very low economic growth and a stagnant population, but from their investments in these high growth geographies that are adjacent to them. And the more they see the value in this kind of activity, the more they're building bridges 
across because Singapore is an island, the more they're building bridges over and now they're even planning a high speed railway. And this is so significant because if you take the, the post-colonial world, which is most of the world, which is 150 uh, countries in the world, and you start to look at the patterns of their cross-border relations over the last 70 years since the end of World War II, you see this pattern repeating itself across boundaries between post-colonial countries. You see it happening here in Southeast Asia, where these high-speed railways and bridges and other infrastructures are being planned across borders of countries that were fighting very, very hostile wars through the 60s and 70s, right? Uh, think Just think about the Vietnam War. Um, and today they're saying, well, that's all in the past, right? It takes a couple of generations for the political psychology to shift from the sort of very defensive, combative, hostile relations that these countries have with each other to a second generation that just wants to secure their sovereignty and, and you know, focus internally on nation building to a third generation of leaders, which is what basically all the post-colonial world has today in East Africa, uh, parts of the Middle East, certainly in Southeast Asia, this third generation that has no living memory of, uh, of World War II and of decolonization, mm -hmm. but really wants to provide for their people and wants to participate in global supply chains and realizes that they can't do it without connecting to their neighbors. So I see this as a very positive story. And the reason that Southeast Asia is such a huge growth market today, in fact, ASEAN, the, the 10 countries of ASEAN get more foreign investment than all of China does today with half the population. No one country in Southeast Asia could ever compete with China. Right, but if you combine the ten of them together and bring their supply chains and their and their labor markets together, they can compete and they are competing extremely well. It's because so Southeast Asia is the region of the world next to Europe that is um, you know most aggressively pursuing this cross-border uh, integration. So speaking of Europe, I might need to speed up a little bit. Do I? Good. Like five minutes. Oh, five, okay. Three. Oh man, I've got a few more maps to get through. Okay. Uh, you can fudge it to 10. Okay, cool. Um, so, you know, there was a lot that I wanted to say with this, but I'll boil it down to, to just a, a couple of things. Um, this is a map of the oil and gas pipeline network of Western Europe. Now, I mean, Europe is in many ways an egg that cannot be unscrambled. If you look at the currency, we're coming up on 10 years since the financial crisis. Um, which began uh, here in many ways, but certainly affected Europe very, very hard. Um, southern European economies like Greece, people have predict predicted would, would uh, be, be tossed out of the Eurozone. No such thing has happened because like the energy grid of Europe, uh, you really can't unscramble that egg. So European countries have a very hard time figuring out where their energy, uh, you know, or knowing where, the, where it comes from. So I give the example of um, Germany after the Fukushima nuclear crisis. Again, also a great complexity story because after Fukushima, a number of countries like Germany said, we want to go non-nuclear, right? We were going to phase out our nuclear power uh, industry. So assuming they do that, guess where Germany will be importing its power from? France. France gets its power from nuclear. Can Germany go non-nuclear? No, it really can't. Uh, now, that said, Germany is doing great things with grid parity through its investments in solar and wind, and, and they're to be applauded for that. But at the moment, they do import French nuclear power. Uh, so they're not really non-nuclear. The other thing that I really wanted to show with this, though, and the purpose of the creation of this map in the first place, was a very, very significant geopolitical one, which is, which is Russia, because um, people have, uh, you know, many have pointed out that, that Russia is one of the primary sources of energy uh, for Europe and uh, exercises a tremendous amount of leverage over Europe. But what's it's so interesting, what's happening right now in the Ukraine uh, dynamic is that Russia persistently, even before the crisis of 2014 and the seizure of, uh, of Crimea down there, um, has threatened and, and executed oil and gas cutoffs uh, to Ukraine. But when you really look at the way in which the gas uh, pipeline network is developing, such as the controversial Nord Stream pipeline and the Nord Stream 2 pipeline that's being built from Russia directly to Germany, what you find is that even if Russia wants to cut off the flow of Russian gas to Ukraine, what's happening is that the gas that's flowing to Germany is being recirculated back through Poland to Ukraine. And that's called reverse flows. So even when the Kremlin wants to cut off a, you know, um, a sort of an errant uh, neighbor, it can't cut it off because it at the same time wants to profit from selling gas to Germany and Germany just turns around and sells it on. So I've, I've been going to Russia a fair bit recently and I've asked people in the Kremlin, I was like, don't you mind that this is happening, right? That you know your principal energy partner in Europe is Germany and your 
you're trying to strangle your neighbor Ukraine and Germany is just reselling your gas to Ukraine. And it turns out that they're not so loyal to that geopolitical you know, domination of Ukraine. They just want to make money. And they say, oh, well, so long as it's being sold at the right price, you know, that, that's all. <laughs> but the real message of this when it comes to cartography, could you possibly understand the geopolitics between Russia and Ukraine only by looking at the political boundaries. I mean, oil and gas pipelines is precisely what, to a large degree, not just history and uh, you know Putin's Stalinist ambitions. A lot of people like to put things in those terms. But it is fundamentally actually about the control over infrastructure, uh, especially when you're talking about energy powers. So I believe that we should look at the situation that way, because that is exactly how the protagonists and antagonists are looking at it. But we're not using maps of these infrastructures to explain these conflicts, which is part of the reason we're getting it so wrong. Now, um, this is another one. This is literally the, the most significant you know, geopolitical trend of the, of the 21st century is here on this map. And of course, there are no tanks, there are no aircraft carriers on this map. There's just pipelines and railways. Um, and this is, of course, what I mean when, uh, by this is uh, China's Belt and Road Initiative, right? So I've been traveling to every country on this map for 20 years or so and uh, asking the governments, you know, what are the, what are the major projects that you have underway? Which neighbors do you need to connect to? Uh, what are the sectors that you're trying to grow? What do you want China to build for you uh, with all the money that they're pouring uh, into your country? And out comes uh, this map, which is, uh, and a lot of these infrastructures are already in place. And a lot of the things that are going, being built, I haven't even put up here, like uh, ultra high voltage DC power transmission lines to create a pan-Asian energy grid, for example. And, and and so forth. And so the way in which this infrastructural integration is proceeding, um, and you know, it's interesting, the Chinese Party Congress is going on right now. And again, Belt and Road is front and center in China's vision for itself in the world. They're not saying we are, um, you know, once again, the Middle Kingdom set to, uh, you know, conquer all of our neighbors. They're actually saying infrastructure is a global public good, and we are exporting this service and elevating everyone together. And interestingly enough, 70 or 80 countries completely buy into that. And that's exactly what's happening if you go to Pakistan, to Kazakhstan, even to Russia. I mean, every country has its suspicions of China, but every country also desperately needs this infrastructure. Because again, you're looking at a lot of post-Soviet, -co post-colonial countries um, that are fundamentally broken, physically broken. And they have, their populations have grown uh, substantially, and they have not been able to cope. And now along comes China with the assets that are helping them do so. And along the way, what you get is a Eurasian economy, rather than Asia being way over there on the eastern end of the landmass and Europe over here as a western peninsula, really what's happening in the next 10, 20 years is them coming together through these seamless corridors. And as you may know, you can put uh, uh, eight Hewlett Packard laptops onto high speed trains and within 10 days now they're going to arrive through Kazakhstan and Russia, they're going to arrive in Germany. Right. And in the reverse direction now, you've got French wine, Spanish ham, um, you know, baby formula, all sorts of things going to meet Asian demand. So this is a very significant geopolitical uh, uh, factor uh, is, is embedded in the trade patterns. You know, it's an article of faith in geopolitics that the transatlantic relationship, the U.S. and Europe, is the most intense uh, uh, interregional trade pattern in the world. And it's part of what underpins, alongside values and history, the transatlantic alliance. And the value of that uh, annually is about a trillion dollars of trade. Guess what the trade is between um, the European Union and Asian countries, just the major ones, just China, India, Japan, Korea, ASEAN. It's way, way more, way more. And that tells you, if you knew that number, if you knew that it was $1.7 trillion, which is a lot more than trade between Europe and America, you would have no difficulty in understanding why when President Obama called up every single European leader and encouraged them not to join the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank that China founded, they all hung, up, hung, hung the phone up on him, <laughs> right? That's, that's exactly what they did. And they all joined the bank, right? It's an Asian and a European bank, effectively. All you needed to know was that number and to look at this, right? And to look at the potential for the economic activity going on between Europe and Asia. Oh wait, I'm gonna, I'm gonna I gotta go back. Okay, pop quiz before the next one. Uh, in this age of uh, threats of putting up walls between the US and Mexico and increased difficulty of crossing the Canadian border, how many annual uh, border crossings are there between the United States and Canada and the United States and, and Mexico? Pop quiz. If you're watching online, you can vote too. 
<laughs> Very important because you know we've had two years now of, of this presidential election and this administration. We've been hearing about you know swarms of people crossing this border illegally and so forth. You would think that it was you know, um, and yet in 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 all of this political discourse uh, about. Um, about illegal migration across the border. Not one person that I heard, whether on Fox or CNN or elsewhere, ever actually pointed out to the number of people who legally, legitimately, every day, cars, bicycles, on foot, in trucks, cross the US, Canada, and US, Mexico border any year. Can I have a guess, please? 300 million? Well, that would that'd be, that'd be, that'd be, that'd be a bit over. But, but anyone? Two million. 75 million. No, closer. Okay, so I'll give you, give you the facts here. So, 50 million U.S.-Canada crossings every year, 35 million U.S.-Mexico crossings a year. These are the two most heavily trafficked borders on the planet Earth, and they always will be, always, right? They will never, I mean, I've been to the Russian-Chinese border enough times, no, it's not, e even with all the Chinese who want to go and uh, hang out in Lake Baikal, uh, it's not going to add up to that much. We don't appreciate how lucky we are to have two neighbors like this, to have such an intense, enormous volume of physical cross-border uh, uh, activity, human passages across these borders, because we don't, we, we don't know the data, we don't map it out, we don't look at the interdependencies in the energy sector, in the transportation sector, in the specific industries from auto parts to lumber and so forth, between these three countries in North America. But we're incredibly blessed uh, to have neighbors like this with which we actually share such incredible complementarity. So the purpose of this map, which is again from uh, Jeff Blossom, uh, is to map out some of those relationships and even to forecast um, you know, what might eventually, uh, look, what, what sort of uh, hydrological agreements might look like if we needed to take uh, Cal you know, Canadian water, the very sensitive issue between the US and Canada is, is, is water transfer agreements, um, but to start to use potentially Canadian water to replenish American aquifers and, and so forth. I have to, to jump ahead, but I wanted to talk a little about migration. Um, you know, th this is, again, one of these issues around the misperceptions in our present political discourse versus the reality. We talk about Brexit and walls going up and uh, you know, uh, stopping migration um, as, if, as if that's actually happening, but nothing of the sort is happening. We have more people crossing borders every day and every year than ever in history, uh, uh, you know, billion people crossing borders uh, every single year. And most human migration has nothing to do with us, meaning North America, right? Uh, or, or not even with Europe. Most human migration is across post-colonial countries. And nothing that's happening in Western politics, whether it's it's elections in uh, France and Germany or Donald Trump will have even the slightest impact on that, right? And if you look at the real geography of human migration and map it out in this way, you start to see how, um, how inexorable the trend actually is and, and how vast the sums are growing. This also shows you actually remittance value um, across uh, those transactions. I won't have time. I already said a bit of what I wanted to say about the Middle East, but you know, part of the point here, and this is another one from, from the book, was to actually map out again some of the proposed cross-border functional infrastructures of um, railways, electricity grids, uh, pipelines, and so forth that would help the Arab world to find a better map, if you will, than the very arbitrary map of political geography that was inherited or imposed upon it. Um, in, the, in, the, in the sort of interwar years uh, in particular. And I think, again, it's most easy in the Arab world to, to do this sort of conceptually uh, because that has been much more the history uh, of the region because it's in fact been dominated by very large scale empires, the Caliphates, the Ottoman Empire and so forth, that were very transgeographic and, and did not focus on rigid political boundaries. And so the political geography is part of the prison, if you will. It's, it's very dangerous to publicly propose maps for the future of the, of the Middle East. Uh, it's one of these areas that can also earn you a lot of uh, hate mail and, and death threats. Uh, but, but I'll go on the record saying I'm a, I'm a supporter of an independent in Kurdistan, uh, even though that doesn't appear to be happening right now. Uh, last couple of maps. This was one that I did put online. This was made by the British Journal, uh, The New Scientist, um, and they had 
done some early work on looking at what would happen to global agricultural uh, production if the world temperature rises four degrees Celsius above the 1990 baseline used by the IPCC. And as many of you know, we some seem to be approaching somewhere between 1.5 and 2 degrees Celsius of that right now. And beyond two degrees, certain, uh, certain effects might be locked in. Um, what's so interesting here is that you've got the world's largest food producing countries of today, such as the United States, Brazil, um, uh, India, China, Australia, effectively being totally desertified. And you have uh, the, um, the Canada and Russia becoming the two largest food produ producing centers in the world, which are obviously two very large depopulated countries. Uh, the Arctic Circle runs a bit north of that of that uh, sort of you know green line, if you will. Does anyone know what the population of the Arctic Circle is today? In the entire, I mean, the top one third of the spherical, the cone of the Earth. How many people live in that geography? It's, it's less than five million people live in the entire Arctic Circle, and by 2040, perhaps this could be where all our food comes from. So, the reason I use this map is to kick off a conversation, and, and, and uh, obviously I knew going into it what a, what a provocative one it would be. What happens when climate change necessitates very significant uh, uh, human migration uh, shifts, right? And when we need more people to move north uh, to work the agricultural supply chains to feed the world. Now, Canada is a very progressive conversation about this. They have a strategy called Canada 100 million. It's not an official government document. It's more of a white paper that uh, has not been rejected in any way. If anything, if you look at Canada's openness to immigration, you see that they are clearly moving in that direction uh, because um, LIDAR satellite data has shown us just how much more uh, rapidly the northern latitudes of Canada are producing a, a wheat crop, for example, and so forth, and how quickly the permafrost is melting. So like it or not, uh, you know, Canada and Russia are already actually, I mean, year on year, if you look at the agribusiness patterns in both countries, there are two sectors that are growing, or one sector that's growing very rapidly in both countries. So I'm um, going to stop right there, but obviously there's a lot more that, that could be said about the um, about you know the ways in which we can use uh, 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 you know cartography obviously to bring to life uh, some of the very very important and I wanted to focus today on you know again to to my mind some of the big geopolitical economic kind of questions that are very very consequential and I know that in the next couple of days you'll be talking about uh, some of those as well again my my uh, my hope my my aspiration um, is that we're able to combine not only the the the, the natural the political and the functional layers, but also to, in a way, three-dimensionalize them, to be able to uh, capture the um, either the, the demographic data, even looking at things like um, you know human social capital, education levels, incomes, in a three-dimensional way, overlaying on that geography. There's plenty of examples of that. Al Gore, you know, does that in his TED talks and so forth. So we know we can do that. Um, but I think the the motion maps are really critical because uh, you know I work a lot on on supply chains, supply chains of specific uh, industries. So being able to see exactly what where in the process of a supply chain of a particular good, uh, where the resources are, where they're coming from, where they're going, where they're being processed. This is very critical today for those who are looking, for example, at the impact of the impact of 3D printing um, on global supply chains. So how is it going to shift resource consumption? And again, you can, you can already capture all of that data in a very real-time way to map it and then to build scenarios and project forward around it will be so revealing for all of us who work in policy, who are trying to figure out where should investments be made, where are people going to be moving, um, what are the sectors we should be training our labor force for, very, very practical questions we can get a better handle on the complexity that decision makers face in politics in every country in the world. We will do a better job of making those decisions rather than shooting from the hip, which we do quite a lot of these days. Um, and, and it is, in fact, the case that better cartography, right, the more effort, the more resources we put into it, is going to be a very essential part of those solutions. So I hope that uh, that, that is a uh, kickoff uh, for everyone for this, uh, for this couple of days. Again, I'm deeply, deeply honored to be with you this evening, and I look forward to our conversation. Thank you.
maybe in the meantime, just grab the mic. <laughs> First off, I want to thank you for just an utterly fantastic and inspiring talk. Uh, I think, first off, you probably have a very appreciative audience, since most of us are geographers and cartographers here. Uh, my name is Benjamin Sachs. I'm a final year doctoral candidate at Princeton, working in, in history and geography. Uh, and this leads into my, my question, which is the ideas you, you propose, and I think some of which has already been acted on, are fantastic. The difficulty I see it is actually trying to demonstrate and teach these paradigm shifts to larger populations, not just at universities, but in primary and secondary education. So the idea is these are great ideas, using data, remapping, changing the paradigm away from political geography, more into connect connectivity, more into the network functional geography. But how do we actually convey that to 10 or 12 year olds? How do we actually convey that to people who are in American high schools? As, we, as you know as well as I do, the United States doesn't teach geography. And those students who actually are interested, seriously interested in geography, usually have to teach themselves. So I'd be very interested in, in your thoughts on how do we take what we've learned here today and we actually are able to educate many more Americans about this. Thank you. That's a great question. And, um, you know, there, be, because of the way uh, American education system works. They're not all curricula, you know, are nationalized, standardized, and, and, and you know, the schools, the pu public and private divergence, you know, makes it hard to give uh, a sort of overarching answer for, in terms of even giving examples of what's, what's being done, because very little is, is national in that sense, unlike in, in other countries. But, you know, I do see that, obviously, be because kids are so enamored with technology, you know, when you develop these micro modules or curricula around um, having kids go out with OpenStreetMap, for example, and plot out uh, locations and generate maps from that, I've, I'm seeing that happening in schools, for example, um, a regular, a better updating or more more frequent updating of the AP geography curriculum, such as what's happening with the International Baccalaureate. In, in the IB system, in IB schools worldwide, which obviously dominates the rest of the world, but not the US, IB geography is extremely popular. Um, you know, I do talks for, I, I never want to pass up a chance. In fact, I, I try never to miss a chance to speak to specifically high school students in geography classes. But guess what? None of them are in the US, right? It's, uh, I've, I've Skyped into girls schools in Northern England just to talk to them about you know, connectography and, and stuff because there's there's an interest in IB systems and, and A levels that, that doesn't that's not founda foundational uh, here, not required here. It's not a mandatory subject in, in, in secondary schools. It's not part but you could start just by the curricula that you can shape that affect large numbers of students. So social science, civics, right? You know, insinuating geography into those, I think would be uh, the right place to start. And then perhaps having that cool factor of the, you know, iPad, uh, you know, go out and plot places. I mean, I see my own daughter is only eight, but they, they do a lot of this uh, in her school. And I think that gets kids excited. And then at least at, at a, you'll get some basic, you know, conceptual appreciation of geography as a starting point. We're just celebrating the microphone. <laughs> Thank you. I, I loved the maps, and some of them were very uh, compelling. I'm wondering, since you travel around the world a lot, um, you cited a lot of facts, which are, I think, very persuasive to people like us. But at least in this country, facts actually are not very persuasive. <laughs> Whereas images are extremely persuasive and authentic. And I think that there are things like the map of migrations across these borders that could really reach people that don't like to pay attention to facts. And I'm wondering in your experience, are there other countries and other media organizations that use these maps effectively to educate the kind of people who look at the news every day? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. It dovetails very nicely uh, with the other one. Again, I think th there's um, just a historical and just inherent sort of maintenance of geography as a, as a key subject, right, in a, in a lot of systems. Uh, in England, in Germany, I went to high school in Germany briefly, and uh, Erdkunde, as it's called, right, earth science, is, is a mandatory uh, discipline. So you don't, you know, they're always thinking about how to update uh, curricula, so in that sense it's built in. When you're talking about media, 
Um, you know, there again, it's a very private, fragmented uh, picture. Hard to say. I think. I think really, what's very important here is the rise of you know online social media and the way in which um, uh, you know a lot of news organizations are trying to use infographics uh, and sometimes maps to really grab people's attention. You know, so the you know the five charts you need to understand why Trump won. You know, or you know the five charts you need to understand Brexit. You know, and I see lots and lots of this circulating on the internet because it is inherently, sure, media organizations want to grab eyeballs and they also want to make things, uh, they want to deal with the, the attention deficit disorder of, of their readers. But that's actually leading to a positive thing, which is the rise of these sort of, you know, if you will, digestible infographics and, and maps that, that, uh, that media organizations are devising to get people to stay, to keep their eyeballs uh, uh, on the screen. So a variety of sort of, you know, negative factors, if you will, uh, you know, just m relentless media competition to, to provoke and to grab attention um, and to do things in a concise way are leading to a situation where actually it's a good market for cartographers, right, and for infographic designers because the, 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 the burden or the impetus, the onus, the opportunity actually falls to, to you um, to use the knowledge, the skills that you have in terms of developing, um, you know, map-based graphics to, to serve that educational function. And I think maybe that's a call for more uh, cross-pollination maybe, you know, between uh, those who have the facts the academic uh, informa you know, the information, uh, and the ability to present it to get it out there um, in front of, uh, you know, in, in, to, to the media because they actually want it. There's a, there's a sort of desperate hunger, you know, almost to have quality uh, content. Um, so I would hope that that could, you know, tip the needle a little bit and, and make it, if you make facts so sort of, you know, undeniably visible, one would, help that, one would hope that that could help to, to, to change the, the discourse a little bit. Question about connectivity. So many people don't understand <coughs> that word, you know, at a lower level. Mm -hmm. You know, we can talk about all this, and those of us in the room get this. But you talk to somebody on the street, or somebody looking at whatever the news media is saying. But what does that mean for me? Because it's all about me, mm -hmm. you know, and what I'm doing, not about this kind of stuff, yeah. or even talking to you, yeah? And how do we connect with just another person, and then how do we make it bigger? Yeah. It's a great, it's a great question, and look, we notice this now with our own election, this mismatch between how a simple explanation of connectivity could change the way people think, and it's, and it's, lack of success in doing so. And again, Trump and Brexit are really good examples. I remember before the election, um, Obama went on like Jimmy Kimmel live or one of those late night shows and he did this uh, slow jam. Do you remember this? Where he was like kind of singing a tune and, uh, and he made it and part of it was about uh, global trade. You know, and he said uh, again. This is like set to music, but I, I'm I, I'm not a vocal. I'm not I'm not I'm not a musical person. But he said, you know, when it come, you know, basically, Jimmy, when you invest in, uh, you know, in in jobs and economic growth abroad, you're actually raising wages and incomes, and those people will become consumers of our exports. So it's a virtuous circle. And in one sentence, Barack Obama on a late night talk show managed to explain a fundamental truth about you know global trade and its benefits to American workers um, that did. That just you know did, does that actually uh, half of our Congress doesn't seem to understand the basic economics of this. So, you know, unfortunately, I, I do think there's not only a geographic illiteracy, you know, in, in much of the country, you know, uh, and certainly again in the political class as well, but obviously an economic one also. You know, sort of econ 101, geography 101. Everyone needs to go back and, and do those so that we could get some of these things right. Again, some of the numbers that I never heard in the campaign were not only about our cross border. Uh, migration patterns with our neighbors, but also um, the, the the number of American workers that actually depend on uh, trade for their jobs, so export-related jobs, but then also equally significant foreign investment-related jobs, the number of Americans whose jobs are actually financed by foreign capital inflows into the United States, which is an equally large percentage of the American uh, workforce. These are, again, these are not debatable facts, right? But if they are, I don't hear them stated publicly, even by the people who know them. I don't see that, uh, you know, those voices uh, entering the political uh, fray. And, um, 
and, and you could map them out very nicely. Brookings has done some really good work on uh, cross-border supply chains between major cities. So the relationship, again, between, uh, you know, uh, uh, Los Angeles and Toronto or Vancouver and Houston, you know, they've, they've mapped all that out looking at the at, in, in industries like auto parts, pharmaceuticals, technology, and so forth. These are really good infographics these are really good that we should be putting out there and just you know you've got to basically bludgeon people <laughs> with them if you want to get them to understand but you know it, it does take that one-on-one -on -one conversation it's going to take an army of educated people going door to door the way because of the way our political system does in fact work and it, it is what it is so we have to work on those terms and I, I've seen you know politicians I gave you the Obama example who's more prominent than him and, and he said it to an audience of tens of millions it still doesn't really work. You've got to say it over and over in front of all these audiences. I have friends in other countries who are, uh, a friend of mine who is a minister in, in Australia, and when he goes to the local, you know, shopping mall, um, you know, to, to the grocery store, uh, and, and they, they say to him, you know, globalization, you know, I don't want to lose my job, forget it. You know, so it's, it's, it's a real, real uphill, uh, uphill battle. Over here. Um, I may have misunderstood uh, what you said it toward the beginning of your talk, when you were talking, when you we're downplaying uh, the effect of uh, tribal tribalism. Um, I, I'm not sure about that because I see that countries form because of tribalism, mm -hmm. um, and I don't. And I think it's a very powerful thing, and it may be um, uh, affected by religion, by uh, connectivity. But um, I don't. Uh, I'm, I'm doubting your. Uh, your dismissal of it as, mm -hmm. as, as, a, as a potent force. Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't want to dismiss it at all. If anything, and there's a big chunk of the book devoted to the idea of devolution, right? A devolution as the sort of, you know, fragmentation of political authority. And one of the main drivers of devolution is, in fact, what we think of as tribalism, nationalism, and so forth, whether it is, uh, uh, again, state formation throughout history, again, undeniable that, that tribalism, if we want to call it that, or nationalism, ethno-nationalism, and religious identity have played critical roles in that and then the driving force in that. So in, in fact, I completely agree. But I'm saying it's an incomplete picture for a couple of reasons. First of all, there is uh, equal and opposite tendencies such as urbanization, right? And the larger cities become, the more they are actually diverse, right? And reflective of diverse identities coming together. So I have a map in the book that shows you the foreign born, pop percentage of foreign born populations in some of the largest cities in the world. And what you find is that the great cities in the world today, whether it's New York, Toronto, London, um, uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, Dubai, these are all places that have anywhere from, from 40 to 60% of their populations being foreign born. And these are obviously the driving economic and political centers of their countries and entire regions. So clearly, it is not the only human impulse. So I'm not trying to be dismissive of you know, ethno-nationalism, but clearly it's not our only basic impulse because we are organically and voluntarily moving into these cities and voluntarily joining these environments that are actually very much ethno ethnic fusions, if you will. So that's one. The second is that um, even though, even if you fully accept and embrace and celebrate tribalism, and, and again, the funny thing was when I mentioned uh, Kurdistan up there, you know, full disclosure, I, I've, I've supported uh, and been on the boards of organizations that actively support secessionist movements, right? I'm a big believer in uh, independent Kurdistan, Palestine, you know, even if in Catalonia, if that's what they want, although they should obviously do it fairly. But, and the reason is for the following, that the smaller uh, polities become, the less they can actually have any autarky, right? So the more tribalism you have, the more connectivity you have. The reason we have so much cross-border infrastructure today and the reason countries desperately need it is because our countries are getting smaller and smaller because of devolution and tribalism. So a small country cannot provide for its own food, fuel, water, uh, you know, economic goods and services. So they have absolutely no choice but to be more connected to each other. So there's this very, very um, uh, paradoxical logic at the heart of an ever more connected world. It's that this ever more connected world has the maximum number possible of tribal units. So I actually completely celebrate uh, tribe. There's, in fact, the chapter of the book is titled Let the Tribes Win. Um, and, and it's called that uh, for a reason, because uh, if every once every tribe gets its own state, a, you more or less eliminate international border conflicts, and that's actually what's happened today. There are almost no meaningful international border conflicts today. The reason is not because we're all democracies, because we're not. There's even democratic backsliding going on in the world. Democracy is not the reason 
why we have a decline in international boundary disputes. The reason we have a decline in international boundary disputes is because we have had so many boundary conflicts that for ethno-nationalists and other reasons that we've created so many states. And once you create a state, you've actually settled a boundary and there's one less boundary to fight over. So I just think it's a lot more complicated than simply saying, which is again, the way in which it's so often portrayed and, and whether it's political science or the media, there's this default notion that, that the most basic, you know, sort of, sort of truth and instinct and, and, and sort of paradigm uh, is uh, the ethno-nationalist sort of tribal state unit, but, but it's not because there's a lot of other factors at play and consequences to that tribalism that become more important than the tribalism. Matthew, I, think I had a question actually. Uh, in terms of data available, are there uh, psychographics on the emerging global identities that we're seeing that do cross all borders, the next generations who are identifying as, uh, identifying with solving global warming? And in answer to the question about uh, teaching the next generations, uh, the next generation is demanding this already. Mm -hmm. and I'm wondering if we aren't misassessing the need in terms of understanding what is going to stimulate that, that growth of international identities. And is it available in the data already? Emerging identities around global warming, around any other right. Uh, right. Major, you know, who are we going to be in the future, and right. what are those new identities going to be, and how can we graphic that? I think those are those are great questions. So I think there there's two answers. One lies in the area of social network analysis, you know, and, and our ability to take the various uh, streams of information that we have. You call them psychographics, and you know, to to use as proxies, if you will. So sentiments that are issued uh, that are online, you know, Twitter feeds and so forth, geolocating by country, by city, by age group, and starting to see what sort of patterns emerge and also obviously what bubbles we can create around the, the trans geographic linkages and try and correlate them by, by generational, you know, decile of age and so forth. There is a lot of work in that regard in social network uh, analytics uh, going on and I think it's, it's very cool and interesting and I, it's, it's one of the, by far one of the most difficult areas, you know, to, to, to visualize in a way that superimposes itself nicely onto geography right uh, you know it's much easier to just use bar charts or whatever and say you know the number of for example the number of international Facebook friends that people have I have a chart about that somewhere it shows over time uh, the number of the average number of Facebook friends that someone has that are from another country has um, has increased you know sort of threefold on average across a set of countries that have been chosen it's difficult to visualize that on a, on a map per se, right? It's much easier to just have a, a graphic that doesn't have a map base. But I think it would be cool to find that, that fusion. Um, now, the, the second answer is actually one that's based actually on the results of a lot of these uh, surveys, where, you, where you've asked, what, what are those common sentiments? So BBC and Globescan did, uh, did this sort of fairly uh, comprehensive global uh, surveying of millennials uh, to try and tease out what are their you know, sort of values and, and, and sort of priorities in a, in a wide range of areas. And they found uh, that uh, things like uh, right uh, uh, connectivity as a human, or sort of, you know, internet access as a human right, um, right to migration, uh, you know, human rights and transparency in government, political participation. They found a bunch of these sort of common values across countries, north, south, east, west, rich, rich, poor, and so on. And so they, they called it the, the study, the, the first globals. It's the first time where you can say that there is some consistent sentiment. It's not universal, right? Not all, uh, you know, Iraqis and Mexican 20-year-olds feel the same way about, about these things. But you're starting to see in the results uh, a pretty substantial percentage of the populations of, of countries, young populations, uh, expressing similar sentiments about these common values. And so for the first time, you can say that not only are there aspirational universal values, meaning you know, it would be great to end slavery and it would be great to have universal human rights as we've had in the past, but you actually have actively within that same generation uh, people who naturally uh, be believe those things. So they, they've, they've done some pretty good work. I, I cite it in, in the book. And what's, what's I think, final point out that's super interesting is that the percentage of the populations, the, one of the questions that they were asked is, do you think of yourself as a global citizen? And of course, that, that term doesn't actually have any, any agreed upon meaning, but that they let the surveys, uh, you know, sort of interpret it however they like. And they found that the percentage of respondents who identify themselves as global citizens uh, is higher 
in developing countries uh, than even in rich countries. So we have this cosmopolitan bias, right? We think there's this Davos man and that Davos man who comes from Switzerland or America or, or London and is a hedge fund trader and has five passports. That person is the global citizen, right? Uh, um, uh, you know, and that person is sort of divorced from the ground realities of tough, you know, sort of countries and nationalism being more important forces. What you find with the millennials is that the higher percentage of people in developing countries identify uh, as global citizens and view that as one of their identities. And I actually think it's very easy to explain because if you come from a large, poor, developing country that may have obviously some kind of some sense of identity, but it's not a fulfilling one to you, right? Because your state uh, is a failed state. Your state, your government is not providing for you. You actually really aspire to belong to something greater than say Egypt today, right? Which is kind of falling apart. Right, as are a lot of other places. So you find that, that, that in Nigeria, in India, in Pakistan, that's where the pious number of young kids are saying, oh, I definitely feel like I'm a global citizen. Like there's something more for me than just being an Indian and being confined to this place. And of course, they wouldn't be able to have that sense as much if they didn't have the kind of technological uh, connectivity and, and access to information in order to derive or download, if you will, this sense of identity from what they're seeing happening outside of their own boundaries, outside of their own borders, even if they never actually get to leave the country in which they were born. I'm afraid we're going to have to stop there. We're about uh, 15 minutes over. So um, uh, I, I know we're just starting this fantastic discussion. But, uh, we have a full day tomorrow. Uh, and uh, we start uh, bright and early at 9 tomorrow. So uh, uh, thank you again, Parag. For thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.